Um, uh, um, first of all, I just I wanted to say uh, it's a, a real pleasure and honor to be here, and I want to thank Teresa in particular um, for the opportunity. Uh, it's also an honor to be uh, on the stage with Dr. Holansky. Um, he's a phenomenal surgeon uh, and a great colleague, and I think his his reference to sort of meeting people in the hallway is how a lot of what we do gets done. Um, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Sort of, kind of, maybe? Okay. Um, um, I, uh, I should note that um, one, of the, one of the questions was about um, patient-centered research and trying to understand whether or not families um, uh, see the same effects that we do in terms of measurements and so forth. Um, PCORI is a, an interesting quasi-governmental agency that's funding um, research at patient-centered level. Um, and there are a couple of studies that are being done for kids and to some lesser degree adults with disabilities looking at patient-centered effects. So I just want to make sure people knew there is stuff that's out there. Um, one of the dangers of asking me um, if I'm willing to talk more is that I will. Um, I also recognize I'm standing in between you and break. Um, so I'm going to do my best not to do too much extra talking. Um, but um, Matt's talk was so um, compelling that there are 50 different things I could be talking about right now that would be useful. Um, so I have no idea where I'm going to be at the end of this talk, and I apologize for that. Um, and, but the transition question is a huge one. It's recognized nationally. It's actually recognized internationally. Um, there are a number of task forces and groups um, both in, in regional and national levels that are trying to figure out ways of handling it. Um, there are at least two groups um, in the Madison um, area and in, in Wisconsin that are trying to figure out ways here in Milwaukee um, and parts north um, to help with those transitions. But a lot of the solutions are going to be done very locally and it's going to be those hallway conversations that make it possible. So the, the question is perfectly timed except that the answer isn't set yet. Uh, but people are definitely aware and looking for it. Um, so I, I wanted to start off just by acknowledging um, the horror in, in Paris. Um, uh, there, there are no words to be able to describe um, the effect of this kind of thing except to say that um, humanity um, needs to, to triumph over these kinds of horrible events. Um, uh, I have no dis financial disclosures either, um, but I am doing something totally different. Um, uh, I'm an historian, I'm policy, wonk, I guess. Uh, I'm an ethicist, but I'm also a pediatric rehab doc. Um, and so there really are a bunch of things I could talk about. And what I originally thought I was going to talk about was history of CP and how it relates to, to policy and society. Um, and if you were to look at a typical history of CP, it would be something like this, which you're not supposed to be able to read. It's basically doctor, 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 doctor. Um, you know, I have cerebral palsy. Awesome. And then a bunch of doctors and researchers at the NIH. Um, which is important, and don't get me wrong, I'm a doctor too, um, but the traditional history has been very focused on what we do, um, as opposed to what patients and families are experiencing. Um, and a friend of mine um, uh, from Boston was uh, in town as a visiting professor talking about um, kids with special needs, and he showed this wonderful image of how this child and their family are surrounded by all of these other social and institutional structures to either support them or hinder them as they're going through the experience of having um, a disability. And that's part of what I want to get at today. Um, this is really about disability. And the nature of disability is not simply, you have a disease, let's move on. It's wider than that. Um, there are two broad models of disability. There are actually a lot of models, but two that I want to get across. One is the medical model of disability, and in fact, it's what Dr. Holansky and I live and breathe every day, um, and it's much of what you were hearing about um, um, during his talk, that the disability itself, itself starts with an illness. It's the result of some kind of physical condition that it's intrinsic to who the person is. It's part and parcel of that person's lived experience. It's in their body, and it can reduce their quality of life and it can cause clear disadvantages for them. Um, but in a just society, if you're going to do something about disability, you're going to try and cure or manage the illness. It's actually part of the three C's for the Weisman Center, right? So a just society will try to identify the illness. 
Um, it will try to understand it through the NIH, through the Wasteman and others. And then it will try to take that understanding and learn to control and alter the course of the condition through the body of the individual. Tendon transfers and um, D rows, and uh, you're going to alter the person's body to adjust to the disability. Um, the World Health Organization um, in 1980 created a model of disability that absorbed that notion very clearly. It said that a disability, a, a, a handicap really, at some point will begin with a disease, it'll be, that'll be the intrinsic um, condition, a situation, it will exteriorize that condition as an impairment, move on to some kind of objectivized um, disability, and then socialize it as a handicap. If you were going to try and turn those crazy words into an experience, think about a child with hydrocephalus. Now, hydrocephalus is a condition that's been part of the human experience um, since we came down from the trees and before. Hydrocephalus is the disease. An enlarged head is the impairment um, that, that makes it poss impossible or very difficult, for example, to sit up unless the hydrocephalus is fixed. And um, for a child trying to go to school without a repaired hydrocephalus, it's very hard for the child to sit in a classroom and look at the teacher. This model works really well. Um, it explains a lot of things, but it doesn't explain everything. Um, much as this cartoon, for the last time, our son is not backwards, he's just dyslexic. It's a matter of perspective. So the social model of disability suggests that, in fact, the condition itself is not the primary driver of presence or absence of disability. It's the barriers, sometimes prejudices, and other exclusionary activities that society creates and puts upon the individual, that those are the ultimate factors defining who has a disability and who doesn't. It does recognize that we're all different, right? I'm looking around the room and everybody's different. That's okay. There's variation around perhaps some norm if you want to describe it that way, but it doesn't have to cause a disability. The variation doesn't. Um, so for example, I've, I wear glasses. I can't be a fighter pilot. Is there a way, in fact, that I could be a fired fighter pilot if we adapted fighter pilot um, scenarios? Probably. Um, not that I would want to. But, um, um, and the easiest way to try and emblematize this for you is, is a case example. So um, uh, if, uh, this is a true story, um, but heavily anonymized from the 1950s. A child was born in the South Pacific Island. The midwife noticed that the child had some creases across its palms, slightly down sloping eyelids, and compared to other kids, it was, when I was doing newborn medicine, it was very loosey-goosey. Um, when it was two years old, it had just begun to say its first um, um, halting words and to begin to stand. So it was delayed, as we would think about it. And by 18, it could speak, though not quite as mellifluously as its peers. Um, and on this particular island, none of that meant it mattered. The kid was known as a very happy child, um, and he, um, he became a firewood gatherer, which was an honorable um, profession um, on that island. Um, and he grew old in honor, got married, had children. In 2015 Madison, this child um, with cerebral, with, would have Down syndrome, um, um, and that would be a consequential disability. On the South Pacific Island, there was no disability. Same biological condition, same intrinsic disease, presence of disability, absence of disability. And that's what the social model is trying to get across. So at some level, what I want to try and make sure you understand by the end of this talk, which is probably this point, is that there are multi-dimensions to disability. That means there are multi-dimensions we can try to change when we're trying to enhance the quality uh, of experience of an individual with a disability. Um, in the social model, you can imagine it sounds very much like um, something from the civil rights or human rights movement of the 1960s and 70s. This is an idea that was generated at that time. We want to help people um, of different, who are African Americans, different um, racial experiences, um, women and men. We want to try and homogenize their, um, their collective rights. And it was true for people with disabilities as well. Intriguingly, the Institute of Medicine, which is sort of our primary honorific um, agency in the United States, finally absorbed the notion of the social model of disability. Um, when they came out with their third report on disability, up until the point it was all a medical model, by 2008, they said, okay, the social model's out there, we're aware of it, we're not quite sure what to do with it, 
But the lead-off quote was, in fact, by one of the leading advocates of the social model of disability from a humanities point of view, Sharon Snyder. Um, uh, and so the times are changing, which is a good thing. The World Health Organization in 2001, with, um, uh, under the efforts of a number of friends of mine, um, reconfigured that linear model to absorb the social model into what's been called, uh, what's known as the International Classification of Function. Um, the, the 1980 definition and operationalization of that model was really, really simple. It's a very, very small handbook. This one takes a book about this big to explain. Because you can imagine the social features are very complicated to explain and operationalize here and in Milwaukee and in Kansas City and in New York and in Paris and London, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa. All around the world, you have to take into account these various factors as they play out. So if we start with those two notions, <clears throat> um, I'll need some medical history. What year was anesthesia discovered? I've always wanted to do this with a patient, um, but never had the guts. Um, um, part of my work is, is looking at the history of, of kids, and to a lesser extent, adults with disabilities um, in Western Europe and the United States, and trying to understand where our ideas have come from and how they've moved and influenced each other's. Um, I was a physicist before I started all this. This is very much where we're going to be for the rest of my chat, at least. Um, I think I'm going to wind up doing each of these pieces very quickly. Um, but um, I, this is in the book I'm trying to finish up for Oxford Press. This is one of the points I really want to make, is that CP is part of who we are as human beings. Um, that society has certainly had a big effect on disability and CP. We'll talk briefly about the modern stuff, and we're definitely not going to get to the epilogue. Um, so when you think about where CP comes from, it is really intrinsic to us. Um, um, I created a new word for a publication a number of decades ago, I guess, xenodisability, which is the, the experience, meaning, etc., of disability in the animal world, in that sort of foreign set of species. Um, and macaques and um, New Zealand white rabbits have CP. They can be used as models to some degree for, by scientists or clinicians to understand the relationship of CP to the, to the biological structures. Um, but we've also seen evidence of what I would call strongly suggestive of CP, even as uh, long as 4,000 years ago in um, the archaeological remains um, of a two-year-old um, in Thailand. There's also evidence of either polio or CP, and it's really hard in, in the archaeological evidence to know the difference. Um, in ancient Egypt, um, the pharaoh Sipta had an Aquinas left foot deformity, which could have been one or the other. Um, what I would argue is it almost doesn't matter, because if the individual survived with this deformity for a fair bit of time, it means people were supporting them, adapting, and perhaps not paying attention to the nature of the disability. Maybe, uh, but maybe they did care about it. There's an Egyptian stele that also shows um, an Aquinas deformity, which um, often is suggested to be polio, but could be CP as well. Um, there are biblical um, stories that relate to uh, similar kinds of conditions, but we don't know how people responded at those times to those conditions, except in the biblical references. But with Claudius, we know something. Um, so Emperor Claudius, was, um, his name partially comes from being lame. Um, Claudius is the Latin word for being lame or halting. Um, there is a strong argument that because of his lower extremity deformities, he may have been spared from the poisoning of emperors and, and emperors-to-be in Rome at that time because he was thought to be very marginalized. And in some ways, it may have been a selective advantage for him to have something like CP and then to become an emperor. Didn't help in the end, because he was finally killed as well, um, but at least he made it up to the point of being emperor. Um, he was made fun of, he, was, uh, 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 he lived an uncomfortable experience with his disability, but he did survive. Um, Regina Oprum, um, who was a 10th century um, Benedictine, um, argued that at one point, uh, the careless doctor tending to an infant brings about lameness. Should such an infant be desirous of being a cleric be passed over by another who is not so impaired? There was a sense within the church at the time that the imperfection of birth could make you less clean, less able to become a priest, and yet some did. So, for example, um, Hermann of Reichenau, um, 
who was an extraordinary intellect. Um, he, uh, he's probably best known for his musical compositions, um, prefigured here, but he was a scientist, a mathematician, a musical theorist. Um, he was born with a disability. His family was um, an elite. He was, his, fa his father was an earl uh, in Germany. Um, they didn't know how to care for him at home, so they eventually put him into a monastery. And unlike in this experience, Hermann, in fact, matriculated into becoming a priest um, uh, and a monk in, in the monastery itself and went on to change the world with his ideas. Um, so there were structures that allowed people in the pre-modern world to survive and perhaps even to thrive with disabilities. Um, there's a lot more I could say about that, but I just wanted to give those simple examples before we got into the modern world. The fall of the medieval world, the decline of feudalism, the Black Death sweeping some of this in, um, the first attempt at surfing, I suppose, um, 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 changed more than simply how the land was tilled. Um, the early modern period, and it's in the name, um, modern, became notable for institutions, governmental structures, that we would become familiar with, that in fact were far less familiar in the pre-modern world. Um, if we're roughly talking about the 300 years from 1500 to 1800, we see nation states becoming more important. This is perhaps some of what ISIL or ISIS is dealing with now. Um, but bureaucracies become a primary feature of Western life. How do you, and as an individual, interface with a government or a nation? You do so through a bureaucracy. And a lot of it is propagated through wars. The French bureaucracy is better than the English bureaucracy. You don't believe it? We're going to war. I mean, that's what it amounts to in some levels. Um, certainly, religion begins to change, and technology has profound um, effects, particularly through the printing press. Um, disability experience changes materially, too. So up until the early modern period, the disability response existed at two levels. One was at the human interaction level, and most of it was in very small villages or less than villages throughout Western Europe. Everybody was trying to eke out some kind of survival, and everybody had to pull together. So the community adapted to the individual because they needed somebody to do something. So if you, were, if you couldn't move very well, you were put on a hill watching the sheep. And you'd have a horn, and you could, you know, you could um, sound the alarm when the wolf was coming. Um, the other standard approach to disability in the pre-modern world was charity, coming in large measure out of um, the uh, uh, Hebraic Christian um, um, ethos. Um, but begging occurred too. As we move into the early modern period, begging becomes criminalized to some fair degree. And the governments of Western Europe recognize that they have to step in and do something different to find a way to deal with the disability problem. Um, work becomes the primary metric for citizenship. You can either work and contribute, or if you can't, we got a problem. Um, so um, a variety of laws in England and France, Germany, and other countries um, are propagated to deal with war veterans with disabilities, with poor people with disabilities, and to some extent with kids with disabilities. Um, uh, and many of these laws have to have a bureaucratic structure to enact them. And one of the primary mediators, um, which is still true, um, a number of our colleagues um, are working with this on a regular basis, doctors wind up being the translator of, how much disability do you have? How much money does that disability equate to? Um, our medical prestige and experience is supposed to be an interpreter um, between the bureaucracies and the individual. And so now, we, nowadays, we still wind up saying, yes, you have a disability, no, you don't. Yes, you're be you get disability benefits, no, you don't. Um, and that all starts at this time. In many ways, um, veterans, the disabled poor, through the medium, through the lens of um, some of the philosophical changes I'm going to describe during the Enlightenment, lead to biopolitical and bioscientific changes through government and philosophy, ethics, and economics to change the experience of disability. But work and cost are the two big drivers. There's a lot more I could say about that. <clears throat> Um, Pre-Enlightenment philosophy, mostly through Thomas Hobbes and the boys in the band in philosophy, um, changes the nature of who we are. 
where we had the Catholic Church before and feudalism to say, this is my relationship with you, that goes away and philosophy takes center stage. And in many ways, um, it's a contractarian principle um, that's uh, evoked by Thomas Hobbes how all of us collectively become part of a nation. Um, that that notion of the social contract is what will drive um, many of the disability experiences in the modern world. Again, um, this is a graduate course I could give you. I'm not going to go through all of this, but the point that Hobbes was generating was why is it people choose to come together as nations? Well, they're making a social contract, a pact, an agreement that they're all going to play together nicely. They come from an initial position. Um, they uh, characterize their, their, contract, their motivations for the contract. And they're largely motivated by something. But they have to use the medium of rationality. And here's where disability falls through the cracks. Because at that time, people with significant disabilities were found to be irrational. They didn't have the cognitive capacity to participate in the social contract, so it was easier to exclude them. If you can't consent, much as in the London, London Foundling Hospital, um, idiots, that is, children with intellectual disabilities, can't be nursed at the usual price um, of other children, and therefore um, we should get, not have them in the hospital and find some other cost-effective way of managing them. This is the 18th century. Coming out of the 16th century, we're still dealing with this challenge today. And the structural solutions we create become age-based. So the question about transition of care, 17th, 18th century. The fact that we don't have a solution, it shouldn't be a surprise. We created the problem over hundreds of years, and I hope it won't take hundreds of years to fix, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. So often, the disabled were left out of the implicit contract, and to some degree, this is the beginning of the tyranny of the normal. Any of you in the disability rights community have heard this phrase over and again. It starts not with the statisticians, but it starts with the bureaucracies of the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, and the way that kids and kids with CP fall into this, I, by the way, I am hopelessly not going to finish anything I expected today, so we'll, we'll just see what happens. Um, so we're talking about transition of care. Um, um, uh, coming out of the Enlightenment, um, uh, Enlightenment philosophers recognized that kids were different. So in the Christian world, we're all born in sin, and therefore children are not innocent. But in the Enlightenment principles of the 18th century, um, 17th and 18th century, we reconfigured our notion, our experience and relationship to children, and felt that children were indeed innocent, that they were born blameless. Um, so if they're blameless and innocent, why would you put a four-year-old with, um, uh, with cerebral palsy into a hospital bed right next to a 45-year-old syphilitic, um, which at that time was moral, morally appropriate? You wouldn't, because the kid would learn bad things and they would be corroded in some ways. So this philosophical principle generated the first children's hospital in the world, the Hôpital des Enfants Malades, the hospital for sick kids in Paris in 1802. Um, and the idea spread like wildfire throughout Western Europe and eventually the United States. Um, now in 1817, the doctors who were rounding in these hospitals got very frustrated. They said, wow, um, we've got these kids here. The ones who are really acute, one of two things happens. Either they get betty, better or they die. Very easy. You know, they're not on my service for very long. It's the kids who have chronic conditions that are driving us nuts because we don't know what to do, but they're still here and they didn't have brilliant surgeons like Dr. Helansky. Um, that kind of frustration led to a petition to the French government to say, we don't want to admit these kids anymore. Fortunately, the French government said, no, they're part of the social contract, you have to include them. So it forced the medical teams to begin to look for other solutions. Um, <coughs> blah, 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 this would be interesting stuff, but I'll leave it alone. Um, so um, I added these slides because Matt was talking. Um, um, the pressures on a new middle class, a rising bourgeois middle class in early 19th century <coughs> France, put enormous opportunity out in front of orthopedic surgeons. Um, now, they weren't doing surgeries anywhere near as con um, sophisticated as what we were just hearing about. But they were driving in people who were worried about the potentials for their children. Um, and um, a number of figures, um, like Jules Guérin, 
were able to generate these extraordinary palaces of learning and care to try and change the, the physical bodies of children um, with disabilities in order to make them more of the middle class. And it was coming out of this kind of tradition, a tradition of putting on these heavy braces and making the bones grow rather like a tree to straighten it up into a, a new direction. But there were others who um, heeded that call as well. Um, one woman, um, her name was um, Masson de la Malmaison, which in French literally means bad house in the 1830s, saw an opportunity in the marketplace. She was not a physician. She had no medical training. But she was a good, um, she was a good huckster, actually. She was, she was able to get out there and drive in business. She produced a couple of pamphlets, in one of which um, she said, the chronic conditions are of all the illnesses which afflict humanity, those which resist most the aid of medicine. Obviously, I'm channeling Julia Child because my, <laughs> my middle-aged French accent is not quite as good. It often happens that the tenacity in them is so great that it is impossible to vanquish them. Thence the hopelessness of the ill and of the physicians. So, in fact, what she said is, wow, I can make money preying on the fears and uncertainties of parents um, who have kids with disabilities for whom doctors right now can't do anything. Fortunately, in some ways, those outpatient forces, which I think revolved around kids more than they did adults, in the inpatient birthed what I would call the interdisciplinary team. So traditional explanations of the birth of physical therapy say it starts with World War I. Often people will even say, no, no, it's World War II, but World War I. But in fact, I'm seeing examples of early physical therapists who are not only being um, invented but trained um, and research being done in the mid-19th century in Paris around kids with disabilities. These self-same kids who caused frustration in 1817 and impelled the birth of orthopedic clinics in the early 19th century in the outpatient world. One character, Napoleon Lene, whose parents were so mm, optimistic about his opportunities that they named him not after one emperor, but two, um, <laughs> was a sergeant in the French army. I would not have wanted to meet this guy in a dark alley, I have to say. Um, he left the army, had been involved in training um, soldiers, um, and began to apply some of his techniques within the Hôpital de, des Enfants Malades and demonstrated improvement in kids through early physical therapeutic techniques. Um, this then inspired the doctors around him to beseech the French government to add in um, indoor and outdoor gymnasia where these techniques could be applied. The concept spread beyond the walls of France um, into Germany and eventually into the, United, uh, into the UK and the United States. In London, for example, the Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is sort of the the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia or Boston Children's of, of England, um, Charles West, um, under a very different set of funding structures, began to spend time thinking harder about kids with chronic conditions, including those with cerebral palsy. And I've been going through his case notes, looking not only for his medical approach, but also the lived experience of these kids to try and add some dimension um, uh, to the patient's um, um, lives. West said, I can't do this alone. I don't have these physical therapists like they have in France. I want nurses who are specifically trained to work with these kids. So he created, if you will, a subspecialty of nursing, which is pediatric nursing, and it became so popular that advertisements in the New York Times um, at that point um, were um, trying to uh, suggest that uh, we should be doing it in the US as well. Um, these nurses became partners in clinical care, but also in research, and in altering the lived experience of kids with disabilities. Um, fortunately, I threw a thank you slide in at this point. I could talk about the U.S., I could talk about other stuff, but I'm going to stop here and try and answer questions. <clears throat>